much for having us. And thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Mm -hmm. to do that. I'm going to ask Mary Ann to start with her song before we, before we change further. I'm your groupie, so yes, yes. <laughs> it's just such an amazing thought that that God didn't create us to annoy him or to be a burden to him, but he created us because he desired us. Let us make man in our own image. God thinks about you, and when God thinks, this is what it looks like. That you are a thought of God, you are a dream of God come true. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like we're a dream of God, <laughs> it feels like we're a nightmare <laughs> to God. But <laughs> the reality is that He sees more than what we may currently see, and He knows more. invited to just dive in and to encounter a God who just adores us and who actually hunts us down, who pursues us. You know, when David says, why God? I mean, I can't even swallow my breath. And, and you, you're there. And at a point where he's running away from God, and he says, okay, maybe if I make my bed in hell, there you're not going to be. And then he says, well, there you are. Your arms surround me. You have found me. Even in the depths of my hell, you have entered it.
So uh, we, we often find ourselves in communities that are from all different walks of life and all different kind of uh, religious backgrounds and I guess that's the same here tonight. So uh, I don't know what all those backgrounds are. <laughs> and um, I can imagine that you know, in all that diversity, if we had to try and figure out what we agree, agree on, there would be a lot of beautiful things to agree on. But normally people try to start with, what do we disagree on? Mm. You know? <laughs> what church are you from? Mm. You know, what, what do you, and I can remember um, <coughs> growing up as well, if, a, if there's not enough division just between different churches, there's different opinions in your own church <laughs> of what God is like and who He is and we have guest speakers that say this and then the pastors say, you know, all these different ideas. And um, it was such a joy for me to one day discover that God and my concepts of God are not the same. <laughs> God and concepts of God are not the same. And um, I guess one of the first times where, well, before I tell you a story, uh, Jesus in John 17, and that's really what I want to speak about this evening. He says, Father, I pray that they may be one, even as we are one. And so ultimately, Jesus doesn't just come to give you another point of view about God. He doesn't come to just give you another theory about his father. But ultimately his goal is that you would experience a unity to the same extent that he experienced unity. So Father, I pray that they may be one. I mean, can you get that? How one is Jesus with the Father? So one that you can say, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. <laughs> and he prays, Father, I pray that they may experience this unity. Even, even as I experience it. I remember as a young child, somewhere, I can't quite remember the age. Probably eight, nine years old, around there. I went on a, a children's camp with, with the church. This is one of those first experiences. Oh, obviously God, you know, is, is busy revealing himself to us in different ways, but this was one of those moments in which it moved beyond theory into a place of experience. And there was a lady at this uh, children's camp that started teaching us about the fact that God still heals just like Jesus healed um, in the days gone by, just like the apostles healed, that, that he still does that. And that was quite exciting because it almost made God relevant um, for me. <laughs> you read all these wonderful stories and you think, why the heck don't you do those stuff anymore? <laughs> as a kid and um, she was speaking about the fact that God still operates and does these things and as she was speaking uh, my brother called me and the reason he called me is because a big scorpion was running towards me and it was quite a poisonous scorpion kids and people who are older or weak have, have died of the sting of this particular scorpion just because of the shock and the, the pain and so he called me and I put my hand smack that on the scorpion and it stung me a few times and I just started yelling in absolute agony um, people grabbed me started praying for me and suddenly I was somewhere else and all I can explain is out of this it was just a white fog 
but out of this fog, a hand appeared. And I, I just knew it was Jesus. And one hand appeared, and another hand appeared, and he had a gift in it. And he, he just said, do you want to come and be with me? Or do you want to receive this gift of healing? Now, I just didn't even have to think. <laughs> I just reached out for the gift. And as I reached out for the gift, I was back, conscious, and the swelling just went, troops, gone. Um, was healed. And, and suddenly, God was no longer just a theory. <laughs> God was no longer just a concept that I had to get right. He wasn't uh, <clears throat> some distant figure, but he was somebody that I suddenly realized was deeply involved in my life, even though I did not know he was involved. He was ready to touch, ready to gift himself to me, even though I wasn't aware of his presence, that he was always there. Now, that, that sense of closeness kind of got frustrated in my teenage years through my religious experience. And you know, then we were, went into different kind of churches. And, and basically the idea that I got from religion is that God is somewhere out there and I am here and if I behave myself better he'll move closer if I'm a bit more holy he'll be more involved in my life is that the common perception you get? <laughs> that's definitely the perception that came to me and so as a teenager I thought well if I can just be more holy then surely God's going to be close and he'll do more amazing things. And that led to such frustration, that, that sense of distance. Um, but there was one occasion again where I thought, okay, I'm going to really try my best. Stop sinning, be more holy. Keep a diary. How long can I go without sin? <laughs> and very quickly thought, oh my goodness, I should be able to break this record quickly. Um, and that frustration led one day where I just fell back on my bed, totally disappointed in myself. And I, sh I was sure God was too. And I again suddenly became aware of just Jesus standing at the edge of my bed. And it surprised me because there was no disappointment in it. There was just absolute acceptance, absolute approval, absolute embrace. He couldn't wipe the smile off his face. He couldn't help himself. He just liked me. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with how I behave. <laughs> it had everything to do with the love within him that just flowed. And, and so in my teenage years, I was again reminded of a God who sees something in me and, and in you that you might not even see yourself, that uh, you might still live in a place of disappointment, but he's excited. <laughs> that you might still live in a place where there's guilt, but all he feels is acceptance. And this encounter with Jesus is a process by which he wants to invert our perspective, bring us to a place where we can see what he sees. So occupied with trying to see God accurately that we miss the biggest wonder, and that is that God sees us. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3, 18 is so beautiful. It speaks about we behold Christ as in a mirror. 
and with unveiled faces. And in this process of beholding, we are transformed. You know, if you look into the eyes of somebody, at one stage you are still occupied <coughs> with what I see. But there comes a moment when your eyes connect, where you are no longer aware of what you see, but you are overwhelmed with somebody else sees you. <laughs> and that, that's the beauty of what happens in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. We behold him, the veil is taken away, but somewhere in that process of transformation, I'm no longer occupied with what I see in God. I become mesmerized with another gaze focused on me. <laughs> and what he sees in me is surprising. See, so much of your identity is your specific point of view. That's what makes you you. No one sees the world, experiences the world, interprets the world the way you do. It's your embodied perspective. If I have to ask you, who are you? You'll probably give me a bit of a history. I am this, I was born there, these were my parents, these are significant events. It's all your story and your story is your perspective. And it's not just things that happen to you, it's the way in which you interpret these events that makes you who you are. And so in this process where my perspective for a moment is lost and I can enter into the perspective of God what he sees <laughs> that transforms us that is a, is a change because it's almost I think it's Psalms 139 Mary and quoted it uh, where David says you your thoughts towards me, God. That whole psalm, David is not excited about the things that he sees concerning God. Robbie is overwhelmed with the fact that God sees him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's not all that excited about his thoughts and his theories and his doctrines and all these things about God, what, what, what surprises him is God's thoughts towards him, God's perspective of him, God's focus on him. And so he says, you, your thoughts towards me are just too much. I mean, you know my sitting down and my standing up. Mm -hmm. Why on earth is God interested? in my sitting down and my standing up. <laughs> it doesn't even interest me. <laughs> I remember the night after I told Mary Ann how I felt about her. We were 18, eh? And um, she told me she feels the same. That was awesome. And I <laughs> went, we went to bed and I was waking up thinking, did I dream that? Because I was in love for a few weeks before that already. And I would come to the realization that wasn't a dream. She really said it. The feeling spiritual. I couldn't wait for the morning <laughs> to come. I just wanted to know where is Mary Ann. I just wanted to watch her sit down and stand up. <laughs> Maybe that is part of what David suddenly perceives that God, for a reason you might not fathom, is madly in love with who you are. <laughs> he knows you're sitting down, you're standing up. And David, in this particular psalm, doesn't feel that spiritual, he kind of gets bothered by all this attention and says, where can I go to just avoid you? Where can I go to flee from the Spirit of God? Can you, can't you just leave me alone? I'm sure you might have felt that after a few days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
<laughs> they, they said, even if I make my bed in hell. There you are. <laughs> your, your arms surround me. You have found me. And so it's this beautiful inversion of perspective. And so that brings us, I think, to the very heart of the gospel. And that is the incarnation. Incarnation is the old English word. It comes from a Latin word, carnate. You probably know carne is, is that Portuguese. It all means flesh. So to incarnate is to become flesh. And that whole idea of God becoming flesh is is birthed out of John 1 verse 14 where it says and the word became flesh uh, tabernacle within us now what is this word that became flesh well John 1 verse 1 says this thought this word this logic that was in the beginning was with God, was God, and all things exist because of His Word. And without Him, nothing exists. So first and foremost, that verse tells us that all of creation is, in a sense, incarnation. <laughs> all of creation is God's thought, God's word, becoming flesh, becoming material. Uh, Psalms 19, for, for many generations, people have somehow sensed that existence itself, creation itself, has a message. And Psalms 19 says it's so beautiful, day after day, night after night, pours forth knowledge, pours forth wisdom. Their voice might not be heard, but their message is going forth. And it declares the glory, the wonder of our God. Now, so that's John 1 verse 1. You know, this, this word, all things exist, read a bit further down, I think it's verse 10. It says, this word has always been in the world, but we did not recognize it. <coughs> Something that I think many of us have misunderstood in our understanding of Jesus is, is we thought that for the first time the Word of God became flesh in the person of Jesus. But what that whole chapter tells us before then is that all creation has always been an act of God pouring himself out into existence. But we did not recognize it. And then, you know, the rest comes, but then the word becomes flesh. And now in Jesus, the message becomes articulate and specific. Now this in itself was, this idea was a scandal. And still is often if we actually look at what it means the, the early church they weren't persecuted because their message was you know so beautifully acceptable it was scandalous to even imagine that God would be at home in human flesh <laughs> let, let me give you a few examples some of the other religions around, the pagan religions, they always perceive God at a very far distance. So, so, and I'll tell you what some of the Jewish ideas were as well. But you'll read these beautiful pagan poems where the God sits on the clouds far away and they look at earth and they can see a war or a wedding, a birth or a murder, and it doesn't move them. Because if they allow themselves to be moved by what happens on this earth, they would lose their peace. And in their philosophy, God is in a state of absolute bliss and absolute peace. And so he can't be too close to your life. <laughs> because your life is not 
the absence of contradiction. There is a bit of crap going on, always. Oh, <laughs> okay. And um, I always use the excuse I'm from a different country. I don't know what words are acceptable at church or not. But you understand it. <laughs> there's, there's a bit of junk going on. And if the gods had to get involved, they're going to lose their peace. So that's the idea of God's peace needs to be maintained by maintaining this distance. Um, the Jewish culture had many different, and it's a rich culture, so there's different perspectives, but one of the perspectives that was very prevalent in the time of Jesus was the understanding of God's holiness as his complete and utter separation from us. That he is so different, so other, that to imagine that, that he can be involved in your life would be blasphemy. Your, your task is just to live well. <laughs> and hope he doesn't come near. Because when he comes near, the mountains melt and everything <laughs> breaks and people die. I mean, go read it. And God shows up, 70,000 people are there, you know, in their, their understanding of who God is. So there wasn't really an interest in the God that was close. Where when Moses comes down and, and he invites people into this place of fellowship with God, God wants to speak to you, they say, no way, you go, <laughs> we don't want to talk to him, I mean, that looks like trouble, it's all thunder and lightning up that mountain, um, so the idea of, of closeness between God and humans was just scandalous, and so for the early Christians to begin to even suggest God is at home in human flesh. That somehow this person of Jesus embodied the heart and the mind of God in such a way that we can say God has found his home amongst us. <laughs> But Philippians 2 tells us exactly that. That God has emptied himself into human form. In other words, God's peace is not something that he maintains by keeping his distance from your crappy life. <laughs> Rather, God's peace is so peaceful that the incarnation is his declaration that he can step right into the middle of your mess and bring his peace there. That his holiness is not his utter separation from you, but his utter and complete dedication unto you. That's why he empties himself in human form. <laughs> The incarnation is God's declaration that I don't want to be God by myself, for myself, or with myself. The only way in which I want to be God is with me, <coughs> for me, and as me. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. So suddenly, yeah. <laughs> this becomes a radically new view and experience of God. That this is not the experience of some distant being that I've got to please with my good behavior. This is not the kind of religion that can, that can maintain a contractual relationship with this, this deity where we never quite know where we stand. I mean, one day he might love us, but the next day he might slap us. <laughs> this, this is a totally new view of God and experience of a God who, who comes and makes his tabernacle, his resting place, in the contradictions of human life. <laughs> and neither is this just one event that occurred 2,000 years ago where we must just look back and say, wow, that was amazing what happened there. Jesus didn't come to show us what we could 
never did. <laughs> he didn't come to say, ha ha, look how it should look like. This is what you mean. Of, but just forget about it. In fact, he goes the opposite way. He says, if you think you've seen amazing things in my life, it's just the beginning. There's going to be even more amazing things happening for those who follow my footsteps and, and, and know the Father in this way. And so, John 1 verse 13 so clearly shows us that the incarnation doesn't just refer to Jesus. Because that verse starts with the word and. It means we should read the verse before. <laughs> so it's not a complete sentence. And the verse before doesn't speak about Jesus. It speaks about you. Verse 13 says, You were born, not of the will of man, nor of the will of flesh, but of God. And the thoughts of God became flesh. And tabernacle, that word, and dwelt amongst us, that's the same word that they used for tabernacle. Remember the Old Testament tabernacle? The picture that that created, it was a mobile skin covered dwelling. <laughs> that was always God's idea to have a mobile skin covered dwelling. <laughs> so the thoughts of God becomes flesh, and God has found his mobile skin covered dwelling place, and of his fullness. Have we all received? Why? Because he deserved it? No, this is just grace upon grace <laughs> upon grace. It is because this is what God desired to do. He desired to pour himself out to empty himself into human existence. It's like Ephesians 1 verse 4 speaks about the fact that God imagined you before the very foundation of this world. He knew, it says, basically, he knew your name. He, he knew you by name. He anticipated your existence. And what he knew about you then so pleased him that he thought, I'm going to put some flesh on this thought. I'm going to make this thought a bit more real. Thank you, Jesus. As you were born, not of the will of man, nor of the will of flesh, but of God. So in a very real way, you are a dream of God come true. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, that's now, that is as scandalous today as it ever was. For the first questions, because religion continues to maintain or tries to maintain a sense of distance, a sense of separation, tries to maintain a sense of guilt, because guilt and fear are great motivators. Um, <coughs> But they don't last. You can might maybe scare your five-year-old for a little while, but don't do this because you know something's going to catch you. But eventually, they grow up and they realize I can't actually do this without all the stories you made up. And I think much of religion relies on the fact that people are going to remain five-year-old spiritually so that we can continue to scare them and keep them guilty and occupied in our programs for the rest of their lives. But somewhere in our relationship with God, there's a calling for us to grow up, to move out of that motivation of fear and guilt into a place that it is love and it's relationship that draws me into the direction that I want to go and no longer the guilt or the fear. 
And so uh, the incarnation is just this beautiful message that God is not somewhere else. He is at home in your life. That's what is missing is not His presence. If there's anything missing, it's your awareness of the presence <laughs> and the enjoyment of God in your existence. That's why Colossians tells us that we were enemies. You might experience a very real enmity in your experience between you and God, but where does that enmity come from? It says we were enemies in our minds. <laughs> our thinking I remember just after we met and we began as missionaries as 18 year olds and started traveling and ministering in Africa and the verse that captured our hearts 2 Corinthians 5 18 that says God has given us the ministry of reconciliation that is that God has reconciled the world unto himself not holding their trespasses against them mm -hmm. now the way we grew up was the gospel is tell people first and foremost what rotten sinners they are and the fact that God is most definitely keeping it against them and then when you've got them feeling as guilty as you can possibly can then offer them the carrot of maybe there is a possibility for reconciliation. Do you know that kind of gospel, or were we alone? <laughs> Do we know it? Do we know it? And this Never verse, heard. this verse awoke our hearts because we never really enjoyed telling people how terrible they are and that God was going to torture them for eternity. <laughs> they, they just didn't sound like gospel. Isn't gospel good news? And so we began with this understanding that God has taken the initiative to reconcile who? The believers? Maybe not even the believers, the people who belong to my denomination. Or the people in my denomination who are faithful. No, the world. <laughs> God has reconciled the world to himself. It also doesn't say that God reconciled himself to the world. Nowhere in the Bible does it speak about God reconciling himself to the world because it's never been God who had a bad attitude. Yeah. <laughs> no, God comes to reconcile the world to himself not holding their trespasses against him and so we began with that beautiful understanding I remember the first time we went we became part of uh, an outreach for a big church in Zimbabwe and they let us lead a mission into an area in Zimbabwe that was full of poverty and there were people in the park homeless people and we we went out and we started praying for people in the park for what we saw they needed. Somebody was sick, we'd say, do you want to be healed? Yes. And we prayed and God would just show up do things. And they got so mad because we didn't first lead the person through a sinner's prayer into salvation. But I figured if God is happy to heal them, why not? You know, <laughs> he can do what he wants to do. Who are we to get mad? Uh, and what a more beautiful invitation to say God's just good and it's his goodness that That's leads right. us to repentance yes. you know what's repentance a change of thinking a change of heart a change of direction it is not our repentance that slowly leads God to be better towards us it's not our repentance that leads God to goodness. It's the goodness, the overwhelming goodness of God that leads us to change our way of thinking and change, change our minds. Hallelujah. And so that, that beautiful verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 became 
that initial motivation to, to be able to approach every person we will ever meet with this one awareness that God has already taken the initiative to throw his arms around them, to draw them unto himself, to love them. And all we come to do is to make them aware that whatever enmity they still experience is in their minds, not in the heart of God. <laughs> because the way, for a long time, the way I understood the salvation is, I'm going to take you to Thank you, Stan. I, I understood it in this way. I thought, uh, you know, for a few thousand years, God tried to get mankind to act properly, but they just continued to mess up and be naughty. And then, <laughs> and then kind of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit had a, a, a council and decided, oh my goodness, one of us will have to go down there and sort this out. And, and Jesus <laughs> drew the short straw. And so it came that my understanding of salvation was the Father was getting more and more ticked off at humanity. And he was getting ready to give them what they deserve punishment they deserve. But, but thank goodness for Jesus because he said, no, 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 before you beat them, rather beat me to death. And uh, he took the father's wealth so that the father could get rid of all his anger issues in, in taking it out on his son. And now he's feeling better about us. Is that the way in which the gospel has ever been presented to you? Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Some of you. Now, in that situation, we are quite comfortable with Jesus because he's the nice guy in, in this trinity. You know? <laughs> but we just hope he never leaves us alone in the room with his father because we just <laughs> don't know what he's going to get up to. <laughs> you know? and, and even our theology of the future is... The father, you know, has poured out his anger on his son, but it's been 2,000 years that you've been ticking me off again. And so it's, it's eventually going to come where Jesus stands out the way and say, okay, have at it. You know? <laughs> the book of Revelation gets interpreted as God's final act of anger. Um, Thank you. Jesus did not come to save us from the father. Can I say that again? Mm -hmm. We did not need to be saved from God. He was never our problem. <laughs> Jesus came to save us from the enmity in our own minds. He came to save us from ourselves and introduce us to the Father. Mm -hmm. the, the, the violence of the cross it's not the sacrifice that we give. Like all the other pagan sacrifices, it's the sacrifice that appeases the anger of their God. And we've overlaid that pagan view of sacrifice onto the gospel. The gospel actually completely inverses that understanding of who God is. That's why John looks at Jesus and says, this is the Lamb of God. This is not your lamb, your sacrifice, with which you're going to appease the mind of an angry God. This is God's sacrifice, God's initiative, God's lamb, with which he's going to change your angry minds. <laughs> we did not need to be saved, and you still don't need to be saved from God. You need to be saved from your own thinking. <laughs> from your own enmity. From your own sense of distance between you and God. Because what God is concerned, He has poured Himself out and made it known with absolute clarity that when you are at your works, in the act, of murdering your creator what does he do 
Father forgive them. They don't know what they did. He waits for us to come to our lowest point and, and at the point where we can be the most evil we can be. He takes that act to demonstrate to us that He will never respond to you in kind. He's not going to reflect your anger. He's never going to give you what you deserve. He's always going to give you what you need to be healed. And so He takes our act of murder and turns it into our salvation. If this God could not be angry with you while you were murdering him. <laughs> yeah, just think about what, it. What else have you got? How else are you going to tick him off? <laughs> it's while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were at our worst, that we took the initiative and said, there is nothing that's going to change my mind about you. I've seen you before you were born. I anticipated your existence. I knew you by name. And what I knew about you then is still my only reference for who you are. Your life has not confused me. You might have confused yourself. But I know that you are love. You are desired. And if you can just rest and accept that embrace, some of that grace is going to start manifesting your experience. Some of that awareness of God's, God's love is going to start manifesting in your own peace, in your own experience of life. So glory, the incarnation continues. God's not somewhere else. He's right here. <laughs> God's not some distant entity who's watching you and trying to just keep you in the right path. He's not afraid of getting involved in all the confrontation, contradiction and confusion of your life. Actually, Genesis 1 verse 2 tells us when the earth was void, chaotic, chaos on the face of the deep. That's where the Spirit of God comes to heart. Mm -hmm. He does His best work in the midst of chaos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he does His best creative acts in the midst of all the confusion. That's where He, he comes to say, man, I'm at home in your existence. <laughs> this is where I want to dwell. Remember in uh, Acts, no, it's in John 3, Jesus meets, and I'll, I'll end with this story, and then we'll just do a song or two, and we'll just have a discussion. But in uh, John 3, Jesus comes to a well, and it's quite interesting how they got there, because Jews wouldn't travel through Samaria. They would rather travel a few days longer to avoid contact with this denomination or this religion because they obviously got it wrong. We don't want any contact with them. So they would travel a long way around, but every now and then, maybe the, there was a situation that was so urgent that they would travel through their country but try not to make eye contact with anyone. And so Jesus finds himself at the well. His disciples went to fetch some food at the nearby town. And the Samaritan woman comes and she knows he's in an embarrassing situation. And he's thirsty, so he says, can you give me water? Oh, how is it that you, a Jew, suddenly now that you're thirsty, now you can talk to and ask me for water. How is it that you ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for water? And Jesus says, well, if you know the gift of God, um, you will ask of me and I will give you waters, uh, uh, living waters. And she says, well, 
did not have anything with which to get to the water. This is Jacob's well. It's got the, it's got the religious history. We come here every day to get our water. And, and he says, um, you know, the water that I will give you, it will become within you a source of living water. <laughs> I so love that. And again, she's confused, and, and he says, why don't you go call your husband? Hmm. So this is a bit of an uh, embarrassing situation. And she says, well, I, I have no husband. He says, oh, that's well put, I have no husband, because in fact you've had six husbands, um, and, and the one you're living with now, or five husbands, the one you're living with now is not your husband. Suddenly she realizes he's a prophet, you know, because he somehow sees into her life what, what, what is not naturally just known. And so she, what do you do if you realize somebody's a prophet? You, you, you speak religion. Oh, I can see you're a prophet. Um, you know, the Jew says we must worship on that mountain, but the Samaritans worship on this mountain. You know, to which church do you go? And, and Jesus says, you know, where you go to worship, <laughs> the time is coming where where you go to worship and how you worship will not matter. Oh my goodness. I would love for a church to put that on their board. <laughs> where you go to worship and how you does not matter. <laughs> That's a, a fun one. And then he continues and he says, it's who you are. It's who you are that matters. It's who you are that's a sacred place of encounter with God. <laughs> and I'm so aware that God wants to, with each one of us, introduce us to the fact that you don't have to go back to the same old religious well to fill up with water again but discover this well this fountain of living water within you <laughs> later on in John as well I think it's John 11 Jesus at the end of the great feast this was the, the greatest religious feast that they had within the Jewish calendar and at the end of this feast, you, you should have thought that by now they have had their fill. They are satisfied. They are overwhelmed with who God. But at the end of this feast, Jesus says, Whoever is thirsty, come to me. Because he suddenly realized that all their religious feasting and activities could not satisfy. Come to me. And I will give you my spirit, which will become in you fountains of living water. <laughs> so that you don't no longer run from, from one event to another, from one meeting to another, to somehow try and satisfy that thirst. But that you become aware that there's a source flowing from you. And every encounter with every person is an opportunity for God to pour himself out through you to another. Glory. I'm going to ask Marianne to just do a song or two and then it's open for conversation and discussion and comments and all that. Thank you.
Show you what you're worth when I 